Today's sponsor is Advancement Courses. Stay tuned at the end of the show for a special coupon for 20% off any of their grad-level professional development courses. Episode 379, The Neuroscience of Play, Gaming, and Learning, and Why Fortnite Might Not Be So Bad. The 10-Minute Teacher Podcast with Vicki Davis. Every weekday, you'll learn powerful, practical ways to be a more remarkable teacher today. What is the neuroscience of play and how does play relate to learning? Well, today we have expert Dr. Dave Neal, who is a researcher in the psychology of play and learning at the Center for Play Education Development and Learning, also called PEDAL, at the University of Cambridge. So, Dave, what kind of learning and development does play promote? Um, We understand some aspects of um, specific areas of development that play seems to promote. Um, There's a lot of theories about it promoting all kinds of areas of development. Um, And the research at the moment, many, many different areas. Uh, It's inconclusive, um, a lot of it, in in whether play helps or how it helps. but it's ongoing. Um, One of the main areas it does seem to help with uh, is um, language development and narrative skills, pretend play in particular, acting out scenarios, coming up with um, situations, acting out characters. This kind of play, there's quite a bit of evidence now that it is linked to children's language skills. Uh, it may also be linked to some more general learning skills, which um, in psychology are called executive function or self-regulation, where children are guiding their own learning and, and um, understanding how to control their own behavior and mon- and their attention um, in order to engage in effective learning. And pretend play and fantasy-orientated play might help with that. Well, you know, in many classrooms around the world, a lot of playtime has been cut in lieu of direct instruction or more content area instruction. And this is one thing in particular I've heard kindergarten teachers say, you've cut out play. So I'm having behavior problems in the classroom. The kids have less less self-control and all these things that you relate to executive functioning. So are there dangers of cutting too much play out of the classroom? Yes, I think absolutely, uh, because there are definitely a lot of benefits for play, particularly for children in the kind of kindergarten age range. For example, there have been studies that show that play can uh, motivate children to engage in learning and engage in activities more than when something isn't played. There was a very old study done in the 1970s where if children were simply asked to stand still, they stood still for a certain amount of time. But if you asked them to pretend to be a soldier who was guarding something, they'd stand still for much longer. Um, There's more recent research done where children who are asked to be a fisherman catching fish uh, would be much more motivated on task than if they were just asked to catch as many fish as they could. Uh, So play seems to provide children with motivation and help them engage in certain tasks. But also, I think with um, play in the classroom, something very important is how it relates to interaction between the teacher and the child. Um, And there's various, there's different aspects to this. Um, One of which is that play can be a high quality form of interaction. Uh, And it, it And it needs to be done in a particular way. I mean, one thing which I think can happen is that a teacher can interrupt the child's play experience and sort of take control of it. And that can actually, I think, inhibit the benefits of play more than promote them. But if a teacher engages the child in play, um, it's that... Uh, uh, working together and uh, building the play experience together, thinking together about problems, creating things together. And the child then is allowed to engage as an equal partner in the experience. And they begin to learn kind of how to think and how to create and how to solve problems, not by being 
told by direct instruction, but instead by experiencing it and collaborating and uh, having this experience modeled for them. So give me an example of, of a teacher or it could also, I guess, be a parent or any adult engaging with a child in play. What would that um, look like? I think it would look like uh, asking questions, stimulating um, the child's thought processes. So if the child was playing with um, a toy um uh, say they had a little uh, toy man and uh, maybe a toy mountain he was climbing they could the teacher could come up and ask what um, say something like oh that looks difficult uh, how, how long is it going to take him to climb to the top um, and and then respond to the child's answers basically giving the the child's input um, a, a high degree of importance in the interaction um, rather than more acting as an instructor where it's their input that is seen as the important factor and they might even suggest some things um, for the child but it wouldn't be it, it wouldn't be them telling the child to do something and um, they might say um oh is he is he what's he going to do when he gets to the top um is he going to put a flag in to to claim this mountain or something they might you could suggest things but not take over the interaction and be playful be uh relaxed be um uh, laughing um include humor um it shouldn't be a serious it shouldn't be an, a serious um instructive kind of experience it should it should be a playful experience the adults should feel like they're playing as well so when students have their playtime in the classroom it's not necessarily the time for the teacher to sit at the desk and grade papers or paperwork it really you think is a time to interact with uh, the I students think both types of play are important there's research on both kinds of play um there are a lot of things children can get out of playing on their own uh there's research that links for or um, various types of uh, play with sort of blocks, um, construction play, where they're making things to uh, spatial processing skills, um, and uh, and and some and also some aspects of language development. Um, there's also research on play with uh, other children, which can link to aspects of social development um, and also some motor skills, particularly the more physical kinds of play. So I think those things are important as well. And the important thing is to get a, a mix of the different kinds of play and play interactions to give children the most of the benefits that play can offer. So, Dave, let's let's shift to older children, because, you know, I've done some um, some play things, you know, with with class craft where my whole classroom becomes a game some play activities with older children. Of course, I teach so many children obsessed with Fortnite. It's amazing. Um, play is part of, of students' lives. Is there any role for play and learning uh, with older students? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Um, and I think here, this is games can be one way of engaging older children in play. Um, you mentioned Fortnite, and there is, there is now quite a lot of research on um, video games. Um, some of the results are mixed as to how it relates to learning, but there are some studies that suggest that particularly games in which children are exploring 3D environments, like in Fortnite, uh, seem to help improve uh, memory. And um, some neuroscience studies have found um, an increase in the gray matter in brain areas that are important for spatial navigation, uh, motor performance, um, and memory as well. So there seem to be some benefits to those kinds, those particular kinds of video games. Um, and other video games and other types of games are also being researched. So, you know, I've done some some work in, in Minecraft and Second Life, um, you know, now the 3D mixed reality headsets. And I will say from my experience, when kids are building, let's just say in Minecraft, which yes. is a sandbox game, um, I've seen that, that kids, um, that it's an entirely different experience than when they are, it, they're, they're making the game versus the game, I guess, making them. I, I don't know how to explain the difference. So you're kind of saying the 3D may actually be, be um, 
uh, more positive? Um, yeah, is that I what think you're there's saying? two things to say there. One is that um, they're constructing something in a 3D environment. So I don't know if there's any actual research done on this in relation to Minecraft, but it would seem to me that that you could expect that experience to have a similar effect to play with uh, blocks and constructing physical things, which could relate to the development of spatial skills. And I'd imagine potentially things like planning skills and that they have to think ahead about what they're, they're going to do. Um, the other thing which you said about children, um, how did you phrase it? Children are... are controlling the game or something like that. you phrased it um well yeah i feel like they're so they, they may we may have them make the seven wonders of the world yeah. inside minecraft or you know so it's it's things evolve in that world that are distinct and unique they're almost shaping yes, their world yeah. and i think that's an important general aspect of play uh and minecraft is one of the, i don't think many video games can do that normally in a video game, you're engaging in a, in a world and in a set of uh, possibilities that are quite defined and limited by the, the game as it's been created. Minecraft is interesting because it gives that flexibility to the child to explore and create and sort of take ownership of the experience to some extent. And that is in a general way something which is present in many types of play um when cho when children are playing for example at, at a shop or um playing some kind of adventure experience they are setting the limits themselves they're they're making the decisions themselves and they are in, in those situations they're also doing that in groups Groups, which is a very interesting situation because that involves some kind of negotiation. It involves group thinking. Um, if a child is um, running a shop and somebody comes into the shop, they have certain expectations about how they're each going to behave and how they're going to act out and how the story is going to go. So children in that experience kind of learn how to create and navigate social contracts, which when you're an adult becomes incredibly important because a huge amount of what we do is based around social contracts. So educators, I think it's important to remember that play and games are, they're part of learning and there are ways that we can engage. And those who just immediately say that gaming and play are not part of the classroom are, are missing an opportunity for some exciting and powerful learning. And I think that Dr. Dave Neal has given us some exciting journeys for us to start taking. This is obviously a, a growing field of research and there's a lot to learn, but there's a a lot that we already know. So thank you, Dave, for sharing with us the neuroscience of play games and that Fortnite may not be so bad after all. <laughs> Need some great professional development? Today's sponsor, Advancement Courses, has more than 200 graduate-level online professional development courses for K-12 teachers. You can take these courses for continuing education, salary advancement, or recertification. And these courses have us teachers developing tangible resources to use in our classrooms immediately. Go now to advancementcourses.com forward slash coolcat and use the code Cool 20 at checkout to get 20% off any course. With this coupon, a three grad credit course is only $359. So go to advancementcourses.com forward slash coolcat to learn more and use the coupon code COOL20. Never stop learning. Thank you for listening to the 10 Minute Teacher Podcast. You can download the show notes and see the archive at coolcatteacher.com forward slash podcast. Never stop learning.